Today's guest is in a word inspirational. In 2010, he was inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. He's a three-time major champion, a former world number one, and a gold medal winner, earning all of these awards after being paralyzed at 18 years old in a skiing accident. He is known as one of the pioneers of wheelchair tennis and is one of the reasons why wheelchair tennis has become a worldwide sport. Thank you so much for joining me on Talk Tennis today, Brad Parks. Nice to be here. Thank you. So this conversation sort of came about, um, I was talking to the USTA Southern section and they have a big wheelchair tennis initiative, which I'm starting to learn more about. And I had mentioned at tennis warehouse, like, Hey, I really want to learn more about wheelchair tennis. I think this is a cool, a cool area that we can just kind of absorb ourselves into. And your name was brought up and Rick connected me to a mutual friend. And I got connected to you, Brad, and I'm so grateful for this conversation. So um, thank you for joining. And I just kind of wanted to start from the beginning. As I was doing my research, there's so much to that you've done with your life. But talk to me, start from the beginning. You're a young skier growing up as a skier. Correct. Um, I kind of grew up uh, playing a lot of different sports, but I, I really started focusing on skiing and and I love to surf too because I lived in Southern California. But skiing was certainly my love, and I chose to go to the University of Utah um, because I, I wanted to be in the snow and to ski. And uh, there was an amateur freestyle competition uh, circuit, I should say. Uh, and um, I had friends who were on the pro tour in those days. That was kind of my goal, and uh, but I, you know, wanted to get a degree, and so I figured that was kind of the, the the best thing was to be there. And and I was the very first competition that I was in where I um, uh, over rotated a backflip and broke my back. Believe it or not, tennis was a sport that I did play, and I wasn't you know wasn't on the high school team or anything like that. Uh, um, I did play with I did have a few friends who were on the high school team, and I played with them. But uh, I, 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 it was a sport that I really wanted to get better at. Figuring in the off season when you know I couldn't surf or you know, and of course, couldn't ski because of the snow. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted to uh, really learn to be a better tennis player. So when I got hurt, I mean, I thought maybe I'd get better for 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 months. Well, for a certain period of time, I did think you know you kind of figured you're going to get better. And even though the doctor said, there's no way you're going to get better, you're, um, you're, it's permanent. So I thought, well, okay, well, if it's going to be permanent, then what am I going to do with my life? What sports can I still do? And people had mentioned basketball and they, I think I had heard about that they have races, you know, wheelchair races and things. But uh, I thought to myself, you know, tennis, I wonder if I could play tennis. So really, it was really in the first month, um, when I'm in the rehab, uh, not but before I even was in rehab, when I was still in, I guess, you know, it was out of intensive care, but it was recovering from the surgery, uh, you know, where they put two Harrington rods in your back and, you know, and you're, you know, you're, it was before you even know how to use the wheelchair. It was before I even got out of bed, I started thinking about the tennis. And so it was, um, I just kind of wondered if it could, if it's possible, and it seemed if you could play wheelchair basketball, it seemed logical that you could play tennis. So, uh, it, so I kind of had that on my mind. And so, essentially, was anyone playing wheelchair tennis before you kind of were like, "We can do this in a wheelchair"? Well, it was right after I got out of rehab. So I spent a month in ho- the hospital, and then three months in rehab. But and when I got out of the rehab, you know, I there was a guy there who was a wheelchair basketball player who was you know teaching you know how to do certain things in the wheelchair to to be able to survive and get around and you know we i played some hoops and i played a couple years of of high school basketball so i did like basketball Mm -hmm. Um, but um i didn't know of anybody who played tennis never heard of it but my parents played and and it was just right after i got out of the hospital that i went out and hit with my parents and my parents were playing and my dad looked over at me and just you know asked me if i wanted to try hitting some and i said yeah sure you know i'm in a hospital wheelchair with a high back and big old side guards and armrests and things and you know it was very bulky and uh but you know i hit a couple balls but he 
I assume, as I recall, he fed me balls uh, and then we kind of hit some, you know, and just to see what it was like. And immediately I thought, wow, I mean, I think this is something that I, I want to pursue a little bit and try. Then a month later, after I, uh, I had to go for a checkup back at the hospital. Now, the guy who was the rec therapist, was wheelchair basketball player, had left after I got out and there was a new guy in there. So I went to the my ward, I guess you'd call it. And there were three or four guys who were um, that, that I got to know when I was in the hospital that were still there. So I just thought I'd go and visit them and see how they're doing. And one of the guys said, there's this new um, rec therapist named Jeff, and um, he's playing wheelchair tennis. And I had told this guy, I mean, I told, you know, probably all those guys knew that I was starting to play, yeah. and, uh, you know, on my own. And, and so they thought, you know, guy, you got to meet Jeff because he's playing. And so that was very encouraging to me to think that there's another guy who's doing this. Uh, so we became instant friends. And so it just kind of happened from there and he was really the inspiration behind the, the behind the first tournament okay he told me that he was teaching a class at uh, uh griffith park in los angeles uh and that um, the next year you know we became you know we started hitting together and became friends he lived in la i lived in orange county so we we're an hour hour and a half away but we uh, did have the opportunity to um to really get to know each other and and i kind of came under his wing, so to speak. He um, was an gr- excellent mentor, uh, somebody who was instrumental, I, I would say, in, in that time of my life um, as an encourager and everything else. But uh, so this first tournament they where he was teaching uh, a little bit, um, he uh, they, they ran a tournament. And so and he was the one who came up with the idea of two bounces. OK. And he uh, he asked me about it. I remember him calling me up and saying, "Well, we're going to have this tournament. Um, I really got you got to play in it." And he said, "What do you think? Should we do one bounce or two bounce?" <laughs> and I had kind of gone back and forth during this. This was a period of about a year now, mm-hmm. and, you know, during this period, and I had kind of gone back and forth. And and I started to to realize that we needed to play with two bounces. And again, we're 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 in hospital wheelchairs now. He started making his own wheelchair out of, out of a garage. And it was pretty lightweight maneuverable and, and, and very, very different, but, but, you know, he just made one for himself. And, and then, uh, I said, yeah, Jeff, we gotta, we gotta use two bounces. I mean, that's, that's the way we play. And, you know, whenever I would play with friends, I'd say, Hey, I use two bounces. I would just automatically say that. Right. So it was, it was, you know, years later when it was officially approved, it was like a big deal. You know, it's like, wow, it's part of the rules of the game. You know? yeah. So um, you, you didn't have to, cause you always felt kind of weird. You know, you'd go play doubles, let's say at a club or, you know, with three able-bodied persons and, and, and they, uh, you know, go, oh, you get two bounces. Oh man, well, I'd like <laughs> to have two bounces. There was always a joke about it. So yeah, it was yeah. nice that it became official and you didn't have to play the game sort of thing. Um, I also just like kind of have to pause and think like you were doing all this, like as a young adult, you just, I was 18. I I mean, this is wild to me. First of all, talk to me a little bit about your mentality and like how, I mean, like, was it something where you just kind of kept pushing forward? It seems like you just kind of have this attitude where like, we're just going to keep pushing forward. We're going to make this happen. And like, even going through all your accolades, it's like, okay, he did this, he did this, he did this, he did this. And I think I had, I wrote down one of your quotes, once a champion, always a champion. I think you were quoted saying, and it's like, I can't even imagine at 18 years old being paralyzed in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. And then just being like, okay, now we're creating wheelchair yeah. tennis. Like, you know what I mean? And like, having- I, you know, the, the <laughs> tennis thing, you know, I, when I, when I see where tennis is today, wheelchair tennis is today, it blows my mind that it is, is so accepted that we're part of the grand slam, that it's so professional. And because when we, first started we were worried about always worried that somebody was going to come along and say hey you guys can't be on our court <laughs> and so it, it it's a big difference now that it's so accepted and everything else but i mean it was the, the first year people told me even like when i was in the rehab the first year is very very challenging and it takes a while 
to come to grips. Now, I had this thing, you know, where I finally, you know, I mean, there were there were tears shed. Believe me, there were sad days and it mm. was tough meeting other people that I looked up to, like Jeff. And then mm. there was this guy, Dave Kiley, who was a, um, one of the early wheelchair tennis players and a great wheelchair basketball player and a track guy. And he was just a great all around athlete. You know, I met some of these guys and it was looking up to them when I was first injured was the same for me as it was looking up to these ski guys that were professional that that I wanted to be like when before I got hurt, Mm -hmm. you know, so it was that same thing. And and it's like when I thought to myself, wow, I'm looking up to a guy in a wheelchair. You know, at first it seemed when you're able bodied, it seems really odd, Mm -hmm. but all of a sudden you're disabled now and you look at them and you don't even, a lot of these, I never even saw the wheelchair. I would just see this incredible athlete who, who I thought was an amazing guy. And, you know, I think, oh yeah, well, yeah, he's in a wheelchair. So I thought, well, if I am doing that to these guys, you know, somebody could one day could do that to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, well, I am going to focus on, being the best that I can be in the wheelchair. And if a year down the road or two years down the road or five years down the road, I miraculously am healed somehow, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I get better. Well, then I can look back at those, whatever years those were that I was, that I used a wheelchair I was, and that I was disabled as, wow, what an experience. It was like, you know, but now I'm, I'm normal. I'm, I can walk, I can do everything. And I said, but I said, I'm glad that I took, you know, made the most of that period of time. And if I didn't get better, then it's like, okay, I'm one step or five steps further along with my life and, you know, living it to the fullest that I can. So I just kind of had that attitude that I need to just, um, just give it my all. And, and, you know, I had faith. In, mm-hmm. in God. And I said, well, you know, I feel like God has a plan for my mm-hmm. life. Even before I was injured, I felt like God had a plan for my life. And of course, I'd never dreamed that it would be someone in a, you know, in a wheelchair and be a disabled wheelchair athlete. But um, I just had to kind of like trust that I'm going to be okay. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's, it's, that's crazy. And like I said, I mean, like, I've chatted with very, several top athletes and like, literally, I just feel like, you, ha- you are meant to create this for, and you've been such, such an inspiration for so many people. And like, just even looking at the university of Alabama, they just built this huge facility for wheelchair tennis. And I'm just like, this is amazing. This is so cool. So maybe you can keep walking me through like that very first tournament. How did it go from there to being accepted into the ITF? And like, was there any pushback or getting into the grand slams? Like how did that work? And I would also assume that like wheelchair players are starting to come out of the woodwork once they eventually find out that there is this opportunity to play tennis. Well, the first tournament I, I played, ended up playing Dave Kiley in the finals of that first tournament. And I was really a tennis player, even though I'd only been injured for a year or or plus year and a little bit, maybe. Um, And Dave was the best wheelchair athlete and, you know, many people over the years have, uh, said that, um, the best wheelchair tennis player, um, is the person who could move. And I noticed that even right from the very beginning, the wheelchair basketball players became really good wheelchair tennis players because they knew how to move the wheelchair. And, um, you know, today I'll, I'll get into it later, um, about the focus really is on mobility, um, in wheelchair tennis. And, um, and, and that's a big change from maybe the early days where we were focusing on just being able to hit the ball, you know, make contact with the ball type of a thing. But anyway, so here I am, I'm playing in the finals of this tournament against the Dave Kiley, who, you know, he was this guy that I kind of looked up to and, and, uh, and I've seen him race and he was amazing. It, he, he, he was so incredible and, and, um, he could move that chair. And anyway, we had a pretty good match. I, I think, I think it went through, I don't remember whether it went two or three <laughs> sets, but you know, I was thinking it went three sets, but it might've only gone two sets. But, uh, and I asked him, I go, Dave, why did you enter that first tournament? And he said, I just felt like I was 
you know, he was such a, he was so good at everything in, in wheelchair athletics that nothing could kind of stop him. And it just sound, sounded like it sounded fun to him. And, and uh, he became, you know, just a top player for the first 10, 15 years of, of the sport. And, and uh, he ran tournaments uh, and everything else. So he became a, um, you know, just a, a great advocate of our sport. But uh, so then that first tournament, it was a success. There are a lot of people who showed up for it. And, and then all of a sudden there's two or three tournaments uh, that rest of that summer. And then these different groups that were involved in wheelchair athletics started running a wheelchair tennis tournament. And, and within that first couple of years, all of a sudden we've got, um, I don't know, somewhere between five and 10 tournaments. And then I, I met this, uh, I did a clinic and I met this teaching professional and, um, we just started talking and the next thing we know it, we decided to form an organization and we called it the national foundation of wheelchair tennis. And our goal was to run a national championships was to promote the sport, grow the sport, develop it, basically be a, like a USTA for, for wheelchair athlete, for wheelchair tennis. And all the, in those days, all the wheelchair sport, even really today, most of the wheelchair sports are run by separate organizations, you know, wheelchair basketball association, um, bowling and the different sports, track and field and stuff. And then you got the Paralympics now, which is um, uh, part of um, the the United States Olympic Committee, um, which is a new thing. But, uh, um, you know, so I never dreamed that we would be part of the USTA back Mm -hmm. in those days. And and uh, I just figured we had, to, if we're going to develop and grow wheelchair tennis, we, you know, we had to do it ourselves. It's right. my job or our job, you know, as a, as a wheelchair tennis player. So uh, we just started all of a sudden, you know, years, a few years go by and we have a, an instructional booklet and we have a national championships um, became the U- U S open wheelchair tennis championships um, became the biggest tournament for, for wheelchair sports. But, one of the things that we were doing a lot of in those early days was trying to just tell people about wheelchair tennis because, uh, and so we thought the best Avenue in the early days was to, um, tie into a, uh, to a professional tennis tournament. So that first year we tied into this tournament out in Palm Springs. Are you in California or? Yes. I'm a, I'm an LA girl and used to live in the okay. desert. So I, I so, got you. <laughs> the, the first tournament was, was then the mission Hills tournament, which yep. is now the Indian Wells tournament. And it was there that, uh, I was hitting on the courts and I was talking to a guy named Tommy Tucker, who was the pro there. And I don't know if you know him, but he's pretty well known tennis professional and, and, um, Charlie Passerell was the tournament director and Dennis Ralston was the, I think the head of tennis at the Mission Hills Country Club. And so I just started talking to Tommy and, and then he introduced me to Dennis. And so when I was talking to Dennis, I asked, would it be possible? It was in a couple of weeks that was going to be that, uh, the Mission Hills tournament. And so Dennis kind of wanted to hit, see me hit. And, uh, I think I hit with Tommy and, and he just goes, wow, this is great. So we ended up doing an exhibition there. And then became close with Charlie. And as Charlie started, um, Passerelle, mm-hmm. Charlie started asking uh, more about it. He introduced us to some other groups where we met other people and we just started really growing. But but one of the things he said to me, he goes, you know, you really need to meet um, Eve Kraft, who was then the, the head of their kind of community tennis section. They were, they were separated um, of the USTA. So we went to their annual meeting and we had lunch with um, Charlie and Eve Kraft. And then Eve just kind of just took me under her wing and she introduced me to all the presidents and to everybody. So we developed this relationship and then we eventually formed a wheelchair tennis or became a, a committee. Okay. A committee yeah. for people with disabilities, you know, because they wanted to branch out to everything. And eventually it became a, a, you know, just focused really on wheelchair tennis. And, and, but that was kind of the beginning. And it was the, it was meeting those individuals. And then uh, Doug McCurdy, who worked underneath um, um, Eve, who ended up going to work for the ITF, it just kind of happened. Will internet, the sport became international. You know, I can remember the first French person in, in probably 81 or 82 came out to our U S open wheelchair tennis tournament. And his name was John, Jean Pierre Limborg. We said, John, go back home and next year, bring more <laughs> people with you. 
So he goes to France and he, you know, gets some things started in France. And the next year um, he brings back, you know, five or six French wheelchair tennis players. And um, one of them was the guy named Pierre Foussard, who became the president of our International Tennis Federation before wow. that became part of the ITF. And then another one was a 15-year-old kid named Laurent Giomartini, who's actually still plays today. And Laurent uh, became, you know, the best player, you know, one of the best players in the world. And wow. So it was just interesting how it just started to grow from there. And one of the gals who's in the uh, Hall of Fame is Chantal Van Derendonck from Holland. And it was one of her uncles saw the French guys playing, this small group of French guys playing. And she had just heard her. She was a nationally ranked player from Holland. She broke her back. And then she becomes, now she's in the Hall of Fame for, for tennis. So she became one of the great players. And, and it just, and it, that's kind of how, how it, it all started growing. Wow. Uh, John Newcomb, I remember we, we did one of the, you, you asked a question there, some of my favorite memories. I know we're probably skipping ahead if That's I go okay. there. But, uh, <laughs> that first year, Charlie, after Charlie saw us at, you know, and he, you know, he introduced us to the ITF or the, to the USTA. He uh, um, said there was this event out in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, and it was going to be, it was originally kind of a Davis Cup style exhibition match where the five top Australians um play against the five top Americans. And this year was their last year of this event. And they decided to bring in the 35. So they had Rod Laver and, and John Newcomb and, uh, you know, uh, Ken Rosewald against Stan Smith and, you know, some of the Bob Lutz and uh, Arthur Ashe and some of these players. So um, we were invited to do this exhibition there. And, and it was there that, that we got to know John Newcomb. And then John Newcomb said, after my practice session, come and hit with me. So I did. And, and he just loved it. He goes, would you come to Australia? And so he introduced, brings us to Australia. And then it was like, we all of a sudden Australia is, is, is involved in it. And this is kind of what happened in those early years. And we would, we would go to a city, you know, like Lincoln, Nebraska, and we had a friend there or a contact. And so we go and she, we would develop a program. And mm -hmm. so we started developing these programs all over the place. And, and, uh, um, it just, uh, one, it took, it just took kind of like one person to get involved, you know, like with Randy Snow, he became one of the great players. I'm not sure if you've heard of him or read about him, but he, uh, um, really one of the great players of our sport and he was a track person and I knew him through track and, and we were doing an exhibition at this track event in a clinic and he didn't want to come out. He said, I played juniors and, and I'm not interested in coming out and, and I said, I've tried it a couple of times and you can't play wheelchair tennis. And, and I said, just come out, just come out. <laughs> he sees me play. And, and, you know, next thing you know, it, you know, he's, he played, he actually played in our very first U S open championships and I played him in the finals. Wow. Uh, so he, you know, because he was such a good player and we were all new, but he was a good player before he got hurt. So he caught on really well and he knew how to push his chair because he played basketball and he raced it and, and then, Dallas became because he lived in Dallas. Dallas became one of our strongest, and even to this day, it's one of the strongest areas of, of wheelchair tennis in in the in the country. And you know, because of that, you know, um, Chantal from Holland, Dutch became this hit. You know, and now today, the the best players in, in the world, especially on the women's side, they're all from Holland. And wow. uh, so you just, it's just amazing how it just started to grow. And and uh, um, you know, when the, when the ITF and the USDA finally, you know, we started with a committee and it just grew. And then all of a sudden they're coming to us and say, we want to hire somebody at the ITF to run wheelchair tennis. And then the a couple of years later, the USDA says, we want to take over. And at that point, you know, we, my wife and I had been running this organization for 20 years and, and we're thinking, you know, I don't know how much longer we can keep doing this. And, and at some point in time, we're going to have to hand it over to somebody, but you know, it was a, it was a struggle financially every single year to, to make ends meet. And so uh, it, you know, we would get these, you know, great sponsors and then they would go and then you'd have to keep looking for more. And, and it wasn't a natural thing for, for us to, to do. And it was a hard, you know, it was a, always a hard sell because there was the charitable aspect of it, but then also the, you know, the, the promotional aspect of it from the standpoint that, 
people do enjoy seeing these great athletes compete. And so it was, um, we, you know, but it wasn't, a, you know, of course, anything like, like a, um, you know, an able-bodied professional event. So there was no comparison to that. And big television wasn't interested in things like that. So it was always very difficult. And so when the USTA came in, it, we, we took a couple of years for them to, to take it over. But we didn't go to them. They came to us, um, which was nice. They felt like it was time to bring it under their wing. And the ITF had been doing it for several years at that point. And so now wheelchair tennis is just part of tennis. It's, we don't have this separate organization. And, uh, you know, we tie into the Olympic Committee just like they do with the able-bodied version. So it's, it's great that we are just part of the game. And, and each year it just kind of grows and expands. And um, it's way beyond what I ever thought. So. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, it's amazing. I just watched um, a video of highlights from the Paralympics and it is so international. There are players like competing and doing well from all over the world. It's, and it's sure like, these are, I mean, like we're talking serious athletes. Like the, I mean, like the girls are just like ripped, like strong, like, you know, like just as much as you would see on the pro tour of an able-bodied player. So like, I did have a couple of questions about maybe what differentiates tennis in a wheelchair from tennis, not in a wheelchair. Like what does your training look like compared? I mean, like, is there different training? What uh, is there a different strategy? I have a few of those sorts of questions and I apologize if they're silly or stupid. Yeah, no, no. I mean, we've always used similar type drills um, over the years, but, you know, as I said, as the, as the sport has progressed, the focus has changed a little bit more from, you know, stroke production and stuff like that to mobility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when you add the mobility factor in there, you know, I mentioned Randy Snow and his coach was Bal Moore and uh, Bal and Randy came together and and wrote up a book, including drills and that sort of thing. And um, myth to reality, they, they called it. And it's still to this day, pretty much everybody who teaches wheelchair tennis teaches from this book. I mean, that's in this rip book was written, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, quite a while ago, but, but that, um, if let's say our sport is 40 years old, I think it's a little bit more than that, but, uh, you know, the first 20 years, it was, it was the second 20 years where that came into play. And at the same time, that was about the same time when the, the wheelchair advanced, you know, when I first started playing wheelchair tennis, I knew even then that, um, okay, so Jeff, I told you he made his wheelchair out of a garage. Mm-hmm. And then, then I asked him if he would make me one, you know, within, you know, a couple of years of my accident. He said, no, but I'll help. I'll teach you to make yours. Okay. So we went into his garage and, and I made my own with his help, which, you know, I could, no way I could have done that on my own. And then eventually um, he formed a company, uh, and tried to get some of the manufacturers at the time to do it, but they weren't interested. They didn't think there was any money into it. And, mm. and uh, anyway, as the years progress, uh, you know, the thought of having a wheelchair specifically for tennis was, mm-hmm. you know, I, I didn't think there was any way that that would happen. And of course it did. It was when we, when I competed in 92 in the very first Paralympics, then 88, it was a demonstration and there were four men and four women invited, uh, and the, it was 92 when it was the first full metal, metal sport. We were still using an everyday wheelchair okay. and we just a- added, a few, you know, made a few changes to it. So we actually, you know, in the early days, we would just y- use our regular chair mm-hmm. and we would go to a tournament. We only had to take a couple rackets and, and our own wheelchair. And then all of a sudden we, you know, started working on the wheelchairs a little bit, making more camber and doing some things. So then all of a sudden you had to actually take a second wheelchair with you. It's complicated travel. Uh, you had your rackets, but it was still not too bad. But then, mm-hmm. you you know, then, you know, it wasn't until like the mid nineties when you had these really specific chairs designs for tennis. And then the mobility completely changed. And you know, we pretty much were a baseline game and then all of a sudden people started moving in a little bit Mm -hmm. more. And, and so you had kind of this all around game and then you're thinking about pushing the wheelchair when in 19, probably 81 or 82, I was just when I first formed this organization 
and I was at a doing a clinic at this wheelchair um, track event. It was a national championships for wheelchair track, and I was at the banquet, and I was sitting down with the commissioner of the wheelchair basketball association, and he was probably the premier um, guy in wheelchair sports all throughout the world. And he Brad, he said, Brad, you're really wasting your time. He goes, you know, I did my thesis, you know, a few years ago. And uh, one of the, on that thesis was what is a feasible wheelchair sport? And I concluded that tennis is not a feasible wheelchair sport. You cannot play tennis in a wheelchair. And I was devastated. And I'm like going, am I wasting my, what, what am, I, I think I go, what am I doing? Am I playing? Am I, 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 I question, am I really doing it? I mean, I'm probably 21 years old. So, and he's, you know, maybe 40 or something and, and, uh, or definitely in it, I'd say he's probably 40 or, or so forties, or maybe he's in his late thirties. I don't know. But, uh, anyway, um, and here's this guy who's the premier guy in wheelchair athletics telling me that what I'm doing is an absolute waste of time. So it, it floored me a little bit and it was very discouraging, but I, I felt he was wrong and we were going to stick, stick with it. And, uh, then there was a tournament a few years later where I looked out and, and I'm seeing all these people who are dressed in tennis clothes and had t- chairs, really good sports chairs in those days. It wasn't a tennis chair, but it was a sports chair and they had rackets and, and I go, I'm looking out. It was an indoor facility and I were 12 tennis courts and I'm in the lobby of this tennis um, club and I, I'm seeing guys in wheelchairs who are tennis players. and. And I said, wheelchair tennis is, is, it's going to happen. And anyway, so then the years go by and and we, um, develop all these, uh, you know, Randy snow and Val develop all these maneuverabilities, um, and ways to get to a ball quicker. And it made such a difference. I mean, if you're, you're going out for, let's say a backhand and you know, you, your back is almost to the ball and you, you hit this ball back. And it's like, we used to turn around the front, which is like mm-hmm. a three quarters turn. And they started going, no, you turn back to the opposite direction. You're back to the ball and it's a quarter turn. All of a sudden, the next ball you're ready for. And if you get caught up into the net, you can then reverse back. And we call it, he called it reverse mobility. So all of a sudden he started incorporating all these drills and all these mobility features. And I remember going to a camp with him um, you know, it was after I'd retired and all, and, uh, you know, and I thought I knew the way to teach wheelchair tennis and they, they would hardly even talk about stroke production. They would only talk about mobility and, um, you know, and then the stroke production would get, the strokes would get brought into it. And you might take something to the side and say, Hey, look at, you need to, you know, get a little more low to high or do something like that. But they never really talked about that. They only talked about mobility. So that was just a huge change. And when did to take a, um, a ball maybe on the second bounce and stay back and, and when to come in. And, and so it was really a mobility. So that was, was such a, a unique difference. And now uh, I was at a camp years later, years had gone by and just maybe 10 years ago. And, and I meet this, this guy who was, who was there from um, Nigeria and he's teaching, you know, he's from this, he'd never been to America you know, never really played that much tennis. And he knows these drills and these things from Randy and Val's book. And it just made me realize how international it had become and how, and really what that it was a huge step through on the changes of how to teach and how to play um, tennis. So there are, there are, there are differences, but you know, it's still tennis. So we're still hitting the ball and, you know, we have some weird things with the, you know, because we get a lot of high balls, you hit balls up in here. So you might have some different types of grips, like for a backhand and stuff. And, um, and, but, but you'll see this though people doing it, maybe in able body tennis, but you'll just see maybe us do it a little bit more and, and you'll see guys moving kind of the way we move too, but, you know, but you know, it's, it's, I mean, there are, there are certainly some, some differences. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And to think because our on our podcast we talk a lot about gear and we like to geek out of gear but like I can't even imagine you could geek out on your chairs and like 
are, is there a difference if you're playing on clay court? Like, would you change up like the wheel pad? Like, I, again, I apologize that this comes off so ignorant, but would you like, because on clay you can slide, is there like, and it would be grittier yeah, just, surface. Yeah. Nothing, nothing really changes. Okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, the first real tournament that we ever really had on clay was in Barcelona in 92. Okay. And it was very unique for us, you know, yes. to all be playing on clay. Some of the European players who were there had played on clay a little bit more, but we hadn't. But uh, yeah, n- nothing even changed then. But today, um, I don't believe um, players are, are really making any changes to their equipment. Uh, um, I honestly, uh, um, I've never asked that question. And I, I, don't, I don't know because I'm not as in tune, but I don't believe there are any changes from what I can tell. Um, well, and we're always talking about how rackets are getting like lighter, but stronger or stiffer or more flexible. So even like with the chairs, I would assume it's a very light, but very durable, like, but maneuverable material. And that seems like that could be really cool for someone that is into engineering, which is not my forte, but. <laughs> well, the chairs now, one thing about the wheelchairs is, is, is where the engineering and, and the changes are, are depending on your style or your disability. So there is a um, one person who plays from France, and he um, is a single leg amputee. Okay. And he has his, I think it's his right knee is bent, and he's almost like he's standing up on that knee. And um, of course, he doesn't have one on the left side. And so he looks almost like he's on his knees. The strapping that goes in into it, um, you know, in our days, you, you know, if you were more able with your disability, you might have some leg muscles and things like that. You didn't need to have to do a lot of the strapping and stuff. And, uh, and if we fell out of our chair, we could get back into it and still get into the point potentially. Um, it's difficult to do that. Uh, where today they roll out, they're all strapped in their chair and they know how to get back up on all fours and you could potentially roll and get back up and still be in, in a point. So it's, uh, and the disability, you know, how they, how they, strap or you know whether you have a waist strap or or different types of straps but the chairs really you are are part of that chair okay and and uh so it is there's a lot of differences with the equipment and as far as tinkering you know you talked about tweaking and and tech and and things like that with the chairs Mm -hmm. i mean they're all just so different i mean well reasonably different um with the way they do it but it but it is uh you know even somebody who's pretty abled, disabled, you know, enabled more of a, you know, person who maybe be able to walk a little bit or is a single amputee. Um, he straps in very similar to, uh, you know, uh, a higher level of injury as far mm-hmm. as just being part of that chair. And, um, it's, it's, uh, the equipment has definitely improved, um, enormously with the wheelchair. That's amazing. And I would assume it will continue to improve with everyone being so innovative in all of all areas of life, it seems, um, which leads me to a question that I have. What is something that able-bodied people might not know about, you know, playing wheelchair tennis or what is something that you could share with us that, you know, I'm just trying to kind of make it a more accessible thing that like we all can, like you mentioned now, wheelchair tennis is part of tennis. It's we're all playing tennis. So I, I feel like sometimes we get to watch like a tiny little piece of the U S open wheelchair tennis finals. And it's so amazing, but like it ends there. So I want to kind of open the door and make it a more, I don't know, a more talked about thing. Right. Is that, is that not weird or is that weird? I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, with, uh, with media attention, with television, with, uh, streaming, um, you know, I think that, uh, one of the things that hopefully with time is you're going to have a fan base like, uh, um, and cause the top players, when you watch the top players, people are, are generally amazed and they're, you know, when you first, I mean, like, you know, about that they're, um, they're played in the U S open and they're in the, but, um, a lot of able-bodied people wouldn't realize that wheelchair tennis is played at, at the four grand slams. And they've been, uh, I think that it was in 90, or 2005 when they added uh, Wimbledon in the U S open uh, the Australian was first and that was in 2002, I believe. Yeah. 2002. And then the, uh, the French was later. And, 
And really, in those early days, we didn't know how well, I mean, singles was not included in the in Wimbledon for a few years later, because, you know, I, I remember trying to play on on, on a grass court years ago, and, and I just didn't think that was going to be possible. And really, clay was not the ideal surface. Um, for so many years, uh, it probably still isn't. I mean, realistically, hard court would be the, the ideal surface for a wheelchair tennis. But it, 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 having it in all four Grand Slams, and it's, right now it's just the top eight. And of course, that could ex- could change in, in time. And and uh, we have a, a World Team Cup event, um, which is uh, you know a lot of people would know. It's sort of a, a Davis Cup, Fed Cup styled event it's it's held in one event it's two singles and a doubles and you know the funny things how that even got started was um we were running the u.s open in 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 our big tournament and all of a sudden you know i told you we had you know these french guys starting to come and eventually um they would come in the weekend before the tournament and try to practice well the courts were, were very difficult to get a practice court and nobody knew these Europeans that were coming across. So we decided we're going to do like a barbecue. We're going to have a, <laughs> a kind of this little fun hit thing and then do a barbecue where all, everybody can get to know each other. And we'll invite even people who are not the, the top guys who are invited to compete in this little fun thing. And um, we decided to do kind of a Davis Cup style, two singles and a doubles. And, and you know, start out with just, I think, four teams the very first year. And then it kind of grew and it started catching on and eventually we had the woman's division and you know and then a quad and of course now they even have a junior division um in it and i think there there's just to get into the main world team cup it's very difficult you have to qualify to get into it because it's gotten so big but that the whole idea of doing that was just to get people together and to you know give them a chance some of the europeans a chance to kind of get used to the courts but before our tournament so it's uh um you know, but now, you know, you know, and at first it was, we held it for the first, I don't know, seven or eight years. And then, um, the ITF, we said, this is your event now and you take it over. And, and, uh, then it would, people bidded to get it. And, and I think it was in Portugal this year. I, I can't remember, or, but it's been, you know, it's all over the world. So a lot of people don't realize that they don't realize that we, maybe we have the two bounces or that we have special chairs or, mm-hmm. or that we could play, you know, a lot of the guys hit with able-bodied players i mean when i first started playing i didn't have there was no disabled really to play with other than jeff and he lived an hour and hour and a half away so um i just hit with able-bodied friends and and uh um and that's the beauty of a wheelchair tennis and you know and that it's just now today it's just part of the game we have paralympics tennis is a big part of the paralympics one of the premier sports and um you know they had some pretty good coverage of the matches and you know, hopefully one day that we, you know, people will actually want to come to watch yeah. these top guys and, and that they'll be, you know, well known, you know, I, and I think some of the countries, you know, Shingo, who's the guy who won the, um, I think he won the U S open this year, um, there in New York. And he also won the Paralympics. He, you know, has probably been one of the greatest wheelchair tennis players, um, at this point with slew of championships that he's won. And, um, and, I, and he's really a well-known athlete, mm-hmm. celebrity personality in, um, in Japan. And, you know, it, you know, we don't have a great player in the States, but, uh, um, I know we have some up and coming juniors that, that, uh, and kids who I've seen who are really amazing at a young age. So hopefully we'll, um, you know, we'll get back, become, you know, one of the powers of, of the sport and, uh, you know, maybe that, that, that will happen as well here. Yeah, that would be amazing. And it seems like there's some programs that are growing and like helping develop these players, but I did also notice, and this is something that obviously our professional players on the ATP and WTA make a lot of money and, or the top, let's say the top 10% make a lot of money, top 5%, yeah. top, top right. 50, make a lot of money. I was looking at the amount of money that the wheelchair tennis the pros are given for a year and it's less than what the Australian open winner will come away with. Oh yeah. And I'm just like, well, how are we going to grow this sport? if like, no one has the funding to like travel internationally. And that's crazy. Well, I tell you what, all I can say is when I tell guys that I played wheelchair tennis with back when I played and who are not, who have not really stayed up on the sport, when I tell them, 
you know, what the guys are making today. They are, you know, kind of jealous in a way, but happy, um, blown away. So it's come a long way. I know we have a long way to go, Yeah, uh, but, but, uh, and I think that in time it will happen. Um, uh, and we will see, I mean, it, 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 it's really mind boggling that we do have professional for a lot of us, wheelchair athletes from the seventies and the eighties and even the nineties. Um, it doesn't matter what sport you're in, whether you're a track star, uh, a, a wheelchair racer who competed in marathons and things where wheelchair tennis today is amazing. And, it, and it's really kind of like surprising, but, but I mean, you look at even the early days of tennis mm -hmm. when Jack Kramer played and Poncho Gonzalez. And then you go further on when, even when, um, uh, Rod Laver and, and, uh, Stan Smith played, um, or if you even go into a sport like golf, Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer, I mean, they were mega stars of the sport, but they weren't making very much money in comparison to today. So it's, That's everything's come a long way and, and wheelchair tennis, um, I mean, I think it's amazing. You can compare it to a lot of able-bodied sports and we're not doing too bad. I mean, I know there are some sports that are starting to progress, but there are a lot of able-bodied sports really who, um, especially on, you know, on, on the women's side, I mean, the amount of money, I mean, I know, I think women's basketball is improving. Women's tennis is phenomenal compared mm -hmm. to, you know, even golf is, is significantly less than the men with the bid make. So, um, it, it, I mean, hopefully that will, will change as well. And hopefully with will disabled athletes, um, the same thing will happen in time. And, and, and I believe it, it, it probably will. And, and, uh, and, but, but really for us to look, look at where we're at today, uh, all I can be is very, very thankful and very proud and very happy and, and, and kind of, I mean, jealous in a good way, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. jealous, maybe not the right word, but it's like, it's like, you know, they, you know, I remember I was telling somebody, a buddy of mine recently who played um, a lot of wheelchair tennis and has not stayed that close to what's going on. And I was telling him what some of these tournaments are starting to, to bring in. He's, oh my, you got to be, you know, just blown away. So, it's, yeah. you know, well, it's well you so guys did that away. though. You guys paved the way you started yeah. that. So it is, right. I can imagine it's, it's still rewarding, even if it's, yeah. Um, how often do you still play? Well, I, I mean, I've had some shoulder injuries and some, and some things. So, um, I, I, I play a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I really, the main reason why I'm not playing that much right now is, is because I've got these art, this arthritis in my shoulders and I probably need to have uh, a surgery called a replacement surgery. And it's, it's a little bit involved, mm. but I don't have the ability to really hit my extension of my arms. I cannot go straight up. So it's it, when I hit anything up high, which, it, and then I'm just, so I, it's very difficult. And when and you play wheelchair tennis, you hit a lot of high balls, you know, because the balls are, you know, springing up. So, so I, I, I played a couple of times this last summer and, and, uh, um, I'd like to kind of just get out and hit on ball machines and stuff. And, and, uh, because then I can just kind of focus on just hitting some nice strokes and everything else. And, and I've gotten into some other sports, you know, kind of in my retirement years, I, I have a mountain bike that's hand powered and, and okay. uh, I do some paddling <laughs> on, on the ocean, a little surfing, paddling yes. uh, boards. And, and then I, uh, I love to ski, you know, I still ski and, you know, skiing was always kind of my, my sport. Um, although tennis it had become that. And, um, and so I still like to do a lot of things, but the kids hit, my kids hit and, nice. and we get out and hit a little bit. And, and, uh, but the last couple of years, because of the shoulders, I've kind of cur curtailed the, the hitting and, and, uh, it's just the way it is getting old. These uh, athletes <laughs> getting old. It's always rough. Um, yeah. random side question that I thought of when you were chatting, did you end up going to college? Um, yes, I did. I, 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 well, I went to the university of Utah where nice. I broke my back. And then I went to, uh, and you finished? Junior, yeah, I went to, well, I went, what, what happened, what happened? Okay. I went to junior college then for a year. And, um, and then, uh, as I was recovering from, and then I went two years. So I actually went four years, but I was a little bit shorter of my degree. And then Jeff Menenbreaker, I was telling you about him. He wanted to, to start developing this sport wheelchair. So I went to, to help him and to work with him. And it was during that period of time when I started the foundation. I always thought, okay, I'm going to go back 
and finish. I think I had just a year left or a little bit less than a year to get my degree. And it was a business degree. And then uh, all of a sudden, 20 years later, um, I'm heavily involved in wheelchair tennis. And so then after I kind of retired from competing and retired from running the organization, I still am involved in wheelchair tennis, but uh, I got into real estate. And, and uh, so um, I was able to do it without nice. my degree. But, <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, a big part of college, I think, is is the growing up years. And, and, you know, I mean, I think living in the dorms was, was great and a great experience and then having an apartment and, and, you know, being in college and, and, um, you know, it was just that all these things started happening and I felt like it was important for me to pursue those things versus the degree. And, um, so I don't think it really held me back in any way, but, uh, it was sort of a, you know, it was something that I, thought about it from time to time and I go gosh I wish I would have been able to finish but you know it's like a a professional tennis player I mean these Mm -hmm. days none of them really have degrees or even in a lot of sports because they if they're good enough they're ready to go pro and so you know unless that doesn't work out then they fall back and and uh, um, hopefully get their degree and, and maybe they'll use it maybe they won't I mean you could have your you know you have a degree and you end up teaching or (laughs) into real estate or whatever. I mean, so there's, uh, there's other things than that. uh, I realized today, but when I was younger, I used to feel like I I should have gone back, but I couldn't stop what I was doing. I couldn't stop competing and I couldn't stop running the organization. And earlier than that, I couldn't, I, that the idea of being involved with this, a uh, wheelchair manufacturing company that we we're start from scratch was just an, an opportunity of a lifetime. So yeah, no, I was gonna, I was gonna say you had you had a life of experience before you yeah. were even twenty five. So that's more than most <laughs> college kids. Tell me a little bit about the award, the Brad Parks Award that you give out. Okay, well, I don't give it out. <laughs> or someone um, gives out and it's under your yes, name. <laughs> I it was funny because I really, honestly, I it was it all of a sudden it was happening. Okay. Now the ITF started this and uh, let's see, it was 93 and they gave me this award. I remember them telling me that uh, after they gave it to me, that we're going to give this out. Okay. The award, um, I think they're, they're similar, the USTA and the ITF award. The USTA, um, I think was in 2002, they started it. Uh, and, uh, but it was, it's to, to somebody who um it's more than just somebody who was a, a, a great player, but it's somebody who's involved in really developing the sport. So it's gone to, uh, I know that the ITF one, it's gone to organizations as well as individuals, you know, guys like Brian Tobin, who was the president of the ITF, who hired um, the first person to come in to work for wheelchair tennis. And so he was, he was really important. We have the, the person who was um, the executive secretary of our organization, Um, when we were first, before we were part of the ITF, it was called the International Tennis Federation, Wheelchair Tennis Federation. So it was just a organization where we met once a year at at our US Open. And, and that was really the beginning of our involvement with that, that ended up going to, to be a part of the ITF. And then there are great players who um, have gotten the award. So it's gone to different, different individuals. And, and I love it when they, you know, allow me to maybe write something about the person. Um, let's say they, they were, they're going to do it like the ITF is going to do a press release or the USTA has invited me to their annual meeting to give the award out or to be there um, when the person is getting the award. Uh, so I like when I get involved, but I don't always, you know, I'm not always able to, to get involved. And um, I've actually, in one case, I um, put in, uh, um, I, there was a person who I wanted to get the award and they, they weren't able to, to do it that first year, but it was like a year or two later where that person eventually did get the award. And so that was, I I know that was really cool to me. And and there are times where I've been able to give the award out. So it's always, always been, been fun. And, and it's so funny. I mean, I know it's got my name on it, but I just look at it as sort of, I know it's the Brad Parks award and I say that, but I don't really look at it as my, (laughs) as my award or anything else. I look at it's a wheelchair tennis award and it just has my name on it. That's just what they call it. So 
um, I don't know. It's kind of, right. <laughs> well, I think you're the inspiration behind it. I'm like, uh, even just in the email exchanges with you, you just have this very like easy breezy, like I didn't really do that much kind of vibe. And I'm like, excuse me. Um, and then also like, it, it was, well, when you say I didn't do that much, it was really such a team effort. And even when I was head of our organization for the first 20 years, you know, my wife and I worked together and we had a, we had a really good staff of people in those days, you know, we could have probably, Winnie and I could have probably done with the technology of today, we could have probably run the whole, or, whole organization. But in those days we had, you know, like seven or eight staff um, to do to, in an office and, and all the, you know, I mean, it was just things where, you know, when we first started uh, communication with the international folks was all through letters and things. I mean, you, we didn't need, mm-hmm. and then when faxes came in, we, mm-hmm. we didn't even have a machine. We had to go down to like a PO, a PO box type or an office supply store to send out a fax to the Israelis or to the, you know, the Europeans who were coming out to the tournament. And then you, when you picked them up at LAX, you just hoped they were there, <laughs> you know, I mean, cause you, you know, it was so different in those days. So, uh, but you know, and then, you know, of course, today, the progress that has been made, mm-hmm. I, I remember we were in our, it was during the, our U.S. Open in Irvine, it was in the 90s, and they're talking about having wheelchair tennis in the Paralympics, and, you know, some of us in the meeting were like, oh, nah, we don't need the Paralympics, that's, I mean, it's, tennis wasn't even part of the Olympics in those days, and, and in, well, this would have been in the 80s, we're like, you know, we don't need tennis, we don't need the Paralympics, we got our U.S. Open, we got our events and stuff, yeah. but but now the Paralympics is, it's become such a, a, a big deal and it's uh, to be a part of it, to be one of the, the, the feature key kind of sports in it. It's uh, it's, it's really helped grow wheelchair tennis. And I think with the Olympics, it's helped grow tennis mm-hmm. because of, of tennis in the Olympics. And so it's uh, it's been an amazing thing to think back and to realize where, where it's all come and gone. That's cool. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you're speaking like a true team player, like as a, I used to coach. So it's like, and whenever you hear someone that is very adamant about thanking or appreciating, appreciating, respecting their team, it's very obvious that, you know, that respect comes through and, and nothing's really coming out. Like I, 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 it's like, we, we, we. So that's, that's amazing too. It's really cool to hear you talk that way. Um, I could literally talk to you all day, uh, but we've yeah. taken up so much of your time right. and I, no problem. I, I do appreciate this, but for anyone listening, what are some resources? Um, maybe some of our listeners know people, athletes in wheelchairs or non-athletes in wheelchairs that might want to get involved in tennis, or maybe our listeners just want to watch more wheelchair tennis or learn more about it. Where can we go? What are some resources that you would recommend checking out? Well, well, I would definitely just recommend, you know, the USTA, first of all, Um, if you're an American, go to the USTA. Uh, You can also go to the ITF, um, their website, and just look up wheelchair tennis at the ITF level. Um, There's just so much information. They really are starting to um, stream the, the different bigger events that they have. And, you know, th- there was streaming involved with the USTA at the US Open. So I think there's just a lot of that. And um, um, if you are going, you know, if you go to a, get it, get the opportunity to go to a Grand Slam, you, um, the, it's the second week when the wheelchair tennis is held. And, you know, when you show up, you know, if you get there early, um, you know, the matches are, are generally on, you know, some of the smaller courts, you mm-hmm. know, um, where they have the junior players and, and I think they have still have senior divisions going on. And, um, you know, occasionally you'll see them on the, um, I think the Louis Armstrong court, maybe the finals or some big a match, but, uh, um, they're generally on, you know, the, the smaller courts and, and they're, they're going to be there at those events. And, and as far as, uh, um, just really knowing, learning more about the sport, um, the USGA website, you can go to wheelchair tennis and they'll have all the different sections. They'll have a program. And if you know, if you want to start playing and that's the best place to go. Awesome. Perfect. And we'll link all of that stuff in this episode. So hopefully it'll be easy to find. Um, do you want to drop like a nugget of like a life lesson to end with? Cause I feel like you probably have a few. <laughs> yeah, that's uh let's see. Um, you know, I, it's really kind of silly 
um, I remember there was a, a friend of my mom's who came and um, this was in when I was injured, it was 1976. And, um, you know, it's this stupid little saying, but it still it still did mean something when when life deals you lemons, make lemonade. <laughs> I know it's kind of a dumb little thing, but but the thing is, is, is you just never know what life is going to bring to you. And um, it could you know, if you're a tennis player, it could be some crazy thing with your shoulder or your knee and it can change everything. And, um, I think you just gotta, you know, recover from the situation and then see where you're at and make the most of life. And, and there's so many things that a person can do. You know, when I was first injured, there really, it was very limited on what we could do with wheelchair sports. Mm -hmm. Uh, and tennis was, didn't even exist. And, uh, you know, today if you're a disabled person, there's so many sports you can do, you know, skiing and surfing and all the equipment's available and, and golf, they have, you know, there's just all this, uh, these things um, that are available to you to do and, and sport wise and to get out there and just make the most of, of what you've got. And uh, I just feel that's really important. No, that's great. That's amazing. And it, yeah, your perspective is so great. And this obviously isn't Aaron this week, but we're, we're recording this the week of Thanksgiving and it's just like, oh, you know, like that kind of, you know, the, the holidays can be tough for people, but may, let's make some lemonade. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. And we always end every episode saying happy hitting. So hopefully you get back on the tennis court soon. <laughs> yes. I, I love, I love tennis. I love hitting a ball. I still the feeling of hitting a tennis ball is so fun and yes. it feels good. And, and, uh, that was always been my love, which is hitting, hitting the ball, hitting you and me, me too. That's my thing. It's like, I, no matter the kind of day you're having, you can just hit a ball and everything's going to be okay. <laughs> That's why I even, it's like I say, even hitting, hitting out with a ball machine. I mean, you get these perfect little balls and you just can sit in one place, move around a little bit, you know, and just, stroke some nice balls and you can get a good workout and it just feels good. Right. <laughs> yeah. And the world. Yeah. Like everything inside the four walls of the fence are like protecting yep. you from everything else. You're all good. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. No. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really, truly appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. This is very insightful and I'm excited to kind of like keep diving in and learning more about wheelchair tennis. Well, hopefully we'll see you somewhere on the courts, right? Yes, definitely. Thank right. you, Brad. Take this is awesome. Yourself.